Hi, I'm Dr Mandy Talbot. I'm the Tourism Degree Scheme Leader. Tourism is located in Aberystwyth Business School. So today's lecture is entitled An Introduction to Wildlife Tourism. If you have any questions about the lecture or indeed studying tourism at Aberystwyth, please contact me at my email address shown here. OK, so this is what we'll cover on the talk today. First of all, I'll provide a background context for the talk and then we'll have a look at the following questions. What is wildlife tourism? Why is it important to study? What factors do we need to consider when examining the sustainability of wildlife tourism? And then we'll have a look at a couple of examples of wildlife tourism, gorilla trekking and the use of orcas at SeaWorld. I will then leave you with some final quiz questions and a discussion question so you can have a think about what you have learnt. OK, so first of all, a context for the lecture. So the aim of the session today is to provide you with an idea of what you will study on a tourism management degree. At university, we aim to equip students with the skills to examine topics critically. We also aim to equip students for their future careers. So here in a wildlife tourism context, we want to give you some things to think about for if you're planning, selling or leading wildlife tours or managing or marketing visitor sites which contain wildlife. Wildlife tourism needs to be managed in a responsible and sustainable manner. Today, tourists are looking for more ethical experiences. So as we go through the lecture, I will ask you a few questions. So do feel free to pause the slide and consider any questions that I ask you. OK, so the first question for you is, what is wildlife tourism? Can you think of any examples? OK, so let's have a look at some of the examples. I've categorised these under two headings. First, non-consumptive. Second, consumptive. What do you think these terms mean? Well, non-consumptive means not taking animals from the wild. Consumptive means taking animals from the wild. Examples of non-consumptive tourism. Well, this is wildlife watching in an animal's natural environment. For example, watching the big five on a safari in Africa. It could be up close encounters with animals in a wild or semi-wild setting. For example, swimming with dolphins. It could be viewing animals in sanctuaries. For example, on Borneo, there are orangutan sanctuaries for orangutans which have fallen victim to the pet trade or logging on the island. It could be the reintroduction of species such as red kites here in mid Wales or vultures in Provence. Indeed, we go to visit the red kites at Nantiarian on a first year field trip. It could be conservation in a captive setting, for example, breeding endangered species in wildlife parks, for example, gorillas. It could be scientific research. Tourists pay to take part in scientific research, such as elephant or wildebeest migrations, or counting the dolphin population here in Cardigan Bay. Consumptive forms of wildlife tourism, well, that includes hunting for dinner fishing, conservation. There are many deer in places like Scotland and so shootings used to manage the number. Or it could be diabolical examples of hunting. For example, lions are bred in South Africa, particularly for the hunting industry and in order to be shot. OK, um, other examples. Entertainment. Animals are often taken from the wild for selfies. Very often the parents are shot. So we can see that we've got some good and bad forms of wildlife tourism here. OK, so here we have a definition of wildlife tourism. It's a summary of what we've just discussed. So the definition here by Higginbottom says wildlife tourism is tourism based on encountered 
with non-domesticated animals. These encounters can occur in either the animal's natural environment or in captivity. It includes activity historically classified as non-consumptive, including viewing, photography and feeding, as well as activities that are consumptive and involve killing and capturing animals, particularly hunting and fishing. OK, so why do we provide definitions? Well, so it's so we know exactly what it is we are studying. But do you know definitions may vary. Some definitions do not include consumptive wildlife tourism activities. Indeed, what you think wildlife tourism is or should be depends on your moral perspective. So do question definitions. OK, so here we have a second definition, and this focuses on the scale and impact of wildlife tourism. So the definition here by Rowe suggests that wildlife tourism can be high volume mass tourism or low volume, low impact tourism. It can generate high economic returns or low economic returns. It can be sustainable or not sustainable, domestic or international and based on day visits. For example, a day trip to Nantiarian to see the red kite or longer stays. For example, specific visits to places like Africa to see safari animals. OK, so we can see at the example in the picture a case of high volume mass tourism in the Serengeti National Park in Africa. This tourism, high volume, may bring in a lot of money to the destination. But what do you think the experience is like for the tourists? And what about the experience for the animals? And what implications does this type of tourism have for their welfare? OK, so another question for you. Why is it important to study wildlife tourism? Well, wildlife tourism is a big and growing market. However, it's difficult to estimate the size because, as we've seen, the definition of what wildlife tourism actually is, is so loose. Wildlife tourism is a popular activity due to the psychological benefits it provides for the people taking part. But what do you think those psychological benefits might be? How might you feel if you saw gorillas up close in the wild? Well, benefits include experiencing strong emotions, for example, wonder and awe. It also provides a chance to connect with nature. And so this is what creates the demand for wildlife tourism. The World Travel and Tourism Council estimate that wildlife tourism contributed 120 billion US dollars globally to the economy. Wildlife tourism accounts for 5% of tourism's gross domestic product and it provides 9 million jobs globally. In 2030, less developed countries where there are high levels of poverty are expected to capture 57% of international tourist arrivals. So that's a billion plus visitors and tourism can be used as a tool to help alleviate poverty. Less developed countries around the equator and the global south are well placed to host wildlife tourism as they contain some of the world's well, most of the world's biodiversity on land and nature tourism is set to increase the most in these areas. So let's have a look at the map here. So the map shows the distribution of some of the most highly valued terrestrial biodiversity worldwide, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and also plants. Uh, so we can see that red and orange areas show areas of very high biodiversity. Green, medium levels of biodiversity, and blue at the poles and in the deserts, low areas of biodiversity on the land. And here are some examples of popular wildlife destinations around the world. And you'll see that most of these lie in equatorial areas or just in the global south. In the Americas, you've got Costa Rica, where ecotourism in the jungle is popular. We've got Ecuador, where tourists like to visit the tortoises and iguanas on the Galapagos Islands. 
in Southeast Asia, we've got Malaysia and Indonesia, where you can see orangutans. And in Africa, we've got Kenya, Zimbabwe and Zambia, where it's popular to go and view safari animals. OK, so carrying on with why it's important to study wildlife tourism. Well, wildlife tourism is lauded as giving wildlife the opportunity to earn its right to survive. If nature pays, nature stays. Some academics like to put an economic value on nature. So, for example, how much do you think an African lion in Kenya is worth over its lifetime in terms of the economic income it brings to the area. Well, it's been valued, lions are valued to bring in about half a million um, US dollars. And a stingray in the uh, Cayman Islands through dive tourism and snorkeling, well, they're expected to bring in about 100,000 US dollars per head in their lifetime. Many vulnerable species are under threat from development and tourism can be both a saviour to natural areas or it can add extra stress and animal welfare can be compromised as tourists visit wildlife sites. Therefore, it's important that wildlife tourism is carefully managed. Management initiatives include managing both tourists and tour operators and taking steps such as capping visitor numbers. It's also important to note that the relationship of wildlife and the local community need to be understood, how they interact. OK, so let's have a look at some factors to consider when examining the sustainability of wildlife tourism. So wildlife tourism needs to be well managed so that it is sustainable. Sustainable wildlife tourism is that which is beneficial to both destination communities and wildlife populations. Sustainable tourism should have a minimum negative impact on host communities and the environment. So each wildlife site has different issues and will be managed differently. However, key questions to consider when examining the sustainability at different sites are one, conservation. Does wildlife tourism help to protect animal numbers and their environment? For example, does it provide an income to protect wildlife? So in Africa, there are high levels of poverty. People will hunt or poach wildlife to feed their family or make an income. Tourism provides an alternative income for poor people other than poaching and hunting. This helps keep animals alive and addresses the issue of poverty at the same time. You also need to think about animal welfare. Does wildlife tourism compromise the health and well-being of animals? And you also need to consider how tourism is managed. What is being done, it, done to manage interactions between animals and humans? And is it effective? OK, so let's look a bit more closely at what we mean by animal welfare. So animal welfare can be assessed considering the five freedoms. So originally, the five freedoms was developed for farm animals, but it can also be applied to wild animals both in um, a wild setting or a captive setting. So these are the five freedoms. Freedom from hunger and thirst. So when we're thinking about wildlife and here in a wildlife setting, can they still hunt if there are tourist vehicles nearby? Freedom to behave normally. So for example, can animals find mates and breed if there are too many tourists around? Freedom from fear and distress. Does tourists getting too close cause stress for the animals? Four, freedom from pain, injury and disease. Is it possible that tourists could spread disease onto animals? And five, freedom from discomfort. So if we're looking at animals in a captive setting like an orca in an aquarium, do they have enough space? OK, so let's have a look now at some specific examples of wildlife tourism and examine their sustainability using the criteria of management, conservation and welfare. Okay, so first let's look at 
the example of guerrilla watching in Rwanda. So the purpose of guerrilla watching in Rwanda is to aid the conservation of guerrilla species and to aid local development. And so some management steps have been taken to enable this to happen. Tourist numbers are capped at 35 a day in order to minimise the impact on the gorillas and the environment. Tourists must go with a guide so that the guide can manage interactions between people and the gorillas, make sure the people don't get too close. Tourists have to buy a permit to see the gorillas. This is expensive. It costs 750 US dollars a day. However, 5% of this goes to aid development in host communities. So that fund has been used to provide clean water, healthcare and schools. In terms of conservation, well, host communities benefit from guerrilla watching through the development fund, through jobs such as guiding hospitality and also the establishment of anti-poaching units to protect the gorillas. And guerrilla watching also provides business opportunities for local people as well. So, for example, ladies often set up craft supply businesses so tourists can purchase souvenirs. So by bringing in an income, this means that local people do not need to rely on hunting or poaching gorillas in order to feed their families. OK, animal welfare. Well, unfortunately, tourists, even though they're managed by a guy, do sometimes get too close. And this causes distress and discomfort for the gorillas. At the same time, there is also the issue of the transmission of human born infectious diseases. Gorillas can catch cold, flu and coronavirus. OK, so, um, yes, gorillas are actually critically endangered, according to the International Union for Conservation Red List. Um, and so we need to take steps to protect them going forwards in the future. So having a think about this example of gorilla watching in Rwanda, do you think it's a sustainable activity or not? Do you think that gorilla watching could be made more sustainable? Well, as you can see, gorilla watching is sustainable because it aids development for local people and it helps to protect gorilla numbers because gorillas are no longer poached. However, we have seen that it's possible for humans to pass diseases onto gorillas. So perhaps greater steps could be taken to manage the interaction between people and gorillas. So is this what gorilla watching will look like in the future? Social distancing with face masks in order to help protect gorillas from infectious diseases? Okay, so let's have a look at another example of wildlife tourism. Let's have a look at the use of cetaceans, whales and dolphins in aquariums. This form of wildlife tourism is not seen as sustainable. Why might that be? OK, well, in terms of conservation, animals are often taken from the wild and this depletes the numbers. In terms of animal welfare, animals suffer greatly in the wild. Orcas live in social groups and travel great distances. So in terms of assessing animal welfare against the five freedoms, we can see that orcas are unable to exhibit their natural behaviour in small enclosures. Indeed, in captivity, orcas have a short lifespan. In the wild, they can live to 90 years old, but research found that wild orcas captured for aquarium, 50% of those died after only four years in captivity due to the stress caused by their living conditions. Let's look at the management. The focus of SeaWorld as a business is generating profits. However, consumer demand 
for products such as SeaWorld is falling as people understand that the welfare of orcas and dolphins is compromised. Remember, people want more ethical tourism products these days. Indeed, 80% of the public think that the confinement of orcas in small pools is a reason to end orca captivity. So, a question for you, as a tour operator, would you sell trips to SeaWorld as part of a holiday package, knowing that orcas were suffering? OK, another question. What do you think SeaWorld should do going forwards? Should they continue with using orcas for their aquariums? Or are there other things that they could do? Could they, for example, focus on boat tours so that people can see orcas in the wild? Should they remove orcas from their aquariums? Some newer aquariums have taken this step. So, for example, in the second year, I often take tourism students to visit Malta and we've been to the aquarium at Bajiba, which was opened um, in the last decade. And there they took the decision not to have a place for marine mammals, dolphins they were looking at because of the distress that it caused them being in captivity. And instead, they focused on a showcase of fish which are found in the Maltese islands instead. OK, so I'd like to say thank you for listening. Hopefully you now understand what wildlife tourism is, why it's important for destinations and how to assess whether wildlife tourism is sustainable or not. On the tourism degrees, we examine the topics of wildlife tourism, sustainability, development, animal ethics and many other topics in a lot more depth. OK, so um, have a look at the report, which I show here for more examples on the use of animals in tourism. This has been written by an advocacy body called Tourism Concern. So hopefully this session today has given you a flavour of what we teach on the degree schemes and how you might learn. OK, so I'm going to leave you now with a couple of exercises. The first one is a consolidation quiz. So have a look through these questions and see what you can remember about the presentation which I've just provided. The second question here is a discussion question. And here I'd like you to have a think about a wildlife attraction that you have visited or would like to visit or one your teacher has told you about and have a think about how sustainable it is using the criteria of conservation animal welfare and management. Okay, thanks for listening and do get in touch if you have any further questions.